there were many long hunters who explored the Appalachian frontier seeking game and furs to trade or sell. Among these long hunters was an almost mythical figure to many folks in the state of Kentucky, Simon Kent. Hello folks, I'm Steve Gilley, along with Rod Mullins, with another one of the stories of Appalachia. Steve, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't there a Kenton College or a Simon Kenton College at one point or another in Kentucky? There's all kinds of Kenton this or that in Kentucky. Yeah, he is, he's kind of like their uh, Davy Crockett. Oh, okay. He's like to Tennessee. Yeah, that's that's Kentucky's Davy Crockett. Well, I've heard of the name before, but I did not know quite what he had done, at least at one point or another in his life, to gain such notoriety in these colleges or names of colleges, towns, or whatever they were. But uh, from reading this and getting ready for it, hmm, seems like he was a pretty important guy. You know, Rod, by the time we're done with this podcast, and I'm going to come right out and say it, there's so much here that we're going to have two parts to this podcast. Wow. You will know a whole lot about Mr. Simon Kenton. Wow. Okay. Well, Simon Kenton was born in Virginia in April 1755, the son of an Irish immigrant father and a mother of Scots Welsh ancestry. Simon had no formal education as a boy. Instead, he spent his time exploring the woods around his family's tobacco farm when he wasn't working that farm with the rest of his family. By the time he became a teenager, he was a tall, straight, auburn-haired, blue-eyed idler, according to his biographer and uh, descendant, Edna Kenton. He fell in love when he was almost 16, and when she became engaged to another boy, Rod, he challenged him to a fight. Kenton lost, but he didn't give up, did he? No, he didn't, Steve. He spent months training and honing his body for a rematch. This time, now well-muscled and six feet tall, he fought until he landed a blow that left his opponent unconscious and unmoving on the ground. Thinking that he must have killed the other boy, Kenton panicked and, fearing being hanged for murder, he took off with nothing but the clothes on his back and pretty much nothing else. He had to have at least something to eat, so Kenton came up with a plan. He would change his last name to the name of the family who lived at whatever farm he happened upon and pretend to be a distant relative looking for work in exchange for room and board. This he did as he headed west toward the frontier for about 100 miles. Well, by this time, he had made it to the settlement of Warm Springs, Virginia, and at Warm Springs, he came upon the home of a widower and miller named Jacob Butler. Well, doing what he did, Kenton gave his name as Simon Butler and told the man he was looking for room and board in exchange for work. Butler hired him, and Simon had found a new home. Over time, the two bonded, the old man and the 16-year-old boy. Mr. Butler hired him to work on his mill dam and farm, which Simon did, becoming increasingly devoted to his employer and host. When Simon felt the time was right to continue west to avoid the law, the miller gave him a going-away present, his prized personal long rifle. Now, Kenton was touched by the generosity and christened the gun Jacob in the miller's honor, then decided, well, he'd just keep the last name Butler for the same reason. He kept that name, Simon Butler, for several years, and frankly, that's how he first became known on the Appalachian frontier, Simon Butler or Simon Kenton Butler. As he made his way through Appalachia, Simon arrived at a settlement near Fort Pitt, now Pittsburgh, and made the acquaintance of two hunters who were headed to Kentucky down the Ohio River. One of these hunters was a man named Jacob Yeager, who had spent years as a child as a captive of a tribe of Indians and who could speak several native languages. Jaeger, who also went by the name the Long Dutchman, told Simon of the vast herds of bison, deer, and elk to be found in the land of Kentucky. The three set off with weapons, traps, and provisions in a new canoe down the Ohio River. At Rod, they went straight into Shawnee Territory. Yes, they did, Steve. The men paddled for weeks, deep into the wilds of Kentucky. They spent two years at a salt lick near the mouth of the Elk River, hunting and trapping, then trading their furs with a trader on the Ohio River for food, clothes, and powder. 
Simon Kitten used his time there to learn the ways of the forest and a forest survival. Well, then in March of 1773, as the three men spent time near a fire trying to dry off from heavy rain that had settled in on them, they were attacked by a party of Shawnee warriors. The Long Dutchman was captured, and he was never heard from again. Kenton and the other man managed to escape without their guns, provisions, and yes, their pants. After five days of wandering half-naked in the woods, that's what you look like when you don't have your pants, they came upon a cabin and were taken in, clothed, thankfully, and fed until they were able to move on. By this time, settlers had begun to move into the area, so Simon, needing to reprovision and to replace Jacob, which had been taken by the Shawnee raiding party, set about helping the new pioneers by finding a game for them in exchange for goods and a new rifle. He liked his new role so much that, well, before long, Simon Butler Kenton became known as a one-man welcoming party to the new folks coming into Kentucky, providing meat, guide service, and protection from Indian attacks. With the new settlers came more and more incidents with the Native Americans who used the land for their hunting grounds, with the Indians attacking settlers and those settlers returning attacks. These incidents continued to escalate until April 30, 1774, with the Yellow Creek Massacre, an attack on a Mingo Indian village headed by Chief Logan, who had been friendly to the pioneers. This incident unsurprisingly set off attacks against white settlements around that part of Appalachia, with Chief Logan taking part in the raids no longer friendly with the Americans pouring into the mountains. This, in turn, led to the governor of Virginia, John Murray, or Lord Dunmore, launching what's known today as Lord Dunmore's War against the tribes of the Ohio Valley. And Simon Kenton Butler was in the thick of that conflict. His reputation as an expert woodsman preceded him as he headed to Fort Pitt to offer his services to the Crown. He was assigned to be a spy, or a scout as we call him today, guiding the Virginia militia through hostile territory. Kenton and another frontiersman, Jacob Drennan, were assigned to scout for a Virginia force that was tasked with destroying a Shawnee village along the Muskingum River in Ohio. Now, this force of 400 was ambushed by 50 Shawnee warriors a few miles from the village, who then offered to negotiate peace. Now, Kenton and Drennan were convinced this was a trap, so they scouted out and found a large force of Indians lying in wait, ready to attack once the Virginians agreed to lay down their arms in peace. After relaying that information to his commander, the militia attacked and routed the Shawnee, burning their village, along with four more before returning home. Once Lord Dunmore's war ended with the Battle of Point Pleasant, Kenton left the military and began an exploration deep into Kentucky, looking for the legendary Cane Lands, which he found with the help of a French trader in 1775. This land was rich in game and contained fertile soil, and Kenton claimed land of his own there on Limestone Creek, where he could hunt to his delight, for the area contained bison, deer, bears, and game birds of all kinds. He didn't just hunt, though. He built a cabin on his wilderness land and planted an acre of corn. At the same time, the Transylvania Company, which through its principal, Judge Richard Henderson, that name figures prominently, I think, in, if I'm not mistaken. Is that North Carolina, Steve? Mm-hmm. He's North okay. Carolina judge. All right. Well, he had signed a treaty with the Cherokee on the Long Island of the Holston near what's now Kingsport, Tennessee, to buy 20 million acres in Kentucky for $10,000 worth of trade goods. Daniel Boone was hired, well, as the company agent, and he was soon escorting scores of settlers into the Kentucky wilderness through that famous place that we all know, Cumberland Gap, and soon came into contact with the man already living there, Simon Kenton. Again, Kenton became a welcoming face to the new pioneers, and again he offered his services as a guide, protector, and hunter to them. His place on Limestone Creek became known as the best landing spot for men, women, and children who arrived, mainly down the Ohio River. Now, these people he'd lead inland to places like Harrodsburg or Boonesboro. 
In fact, he became a close friend of Daniel Boone, using Boonesboro as his base of operations for a time to assist the new arrivals to the settlement. That friendship rod saved Boone's life. You see, in the spring of 1777, around a hundred Shawnee warriors under their chief Blackfish laid siege to Fort Boonesboro, soon causing a shortage of food and firewood inside the fort. Simon Kenton and Daniel Boone sent two men out to find food and wood, but how those two only made it to the tree line before they were attacked. Boone and Kenton led a party of ten men on a rescue mission. As soon as they headed toward the woods, though, a large number of Shawnee left the trees and cut the men off from the fort, wounding seven of them, including Boone, who was shot in the ankle. As a warrior approached Daniel Boone with an upraised tomahawk, Kenton shot the Indian, picked up Boone in his arms, and dashed for the gates to Fort Boonesboro. Now, one story goes, although we aren't sure if this is true or not, that two Shawnee confronting Kenton. Unable to reach a weapon, since he was carrying Boone, Kenton did some quick thinking. What do you think he did, Rod? Well, I would guess, Steve, that he tossed Daniel Boone to the Indians, one of whom was knocked unconscious. Very smooth move out of that. Well, the other was startled, which I'm sure I would be too, giving Kenton time to grab his own tomahawk and kill him. He turned it on him. He then retrieved Boone and dashed inside the fort, saving his life. Well, pretty soon he became famous for his rescue of the great Daniel Boone, everyone knowing the name Simon Kenton Butler, as he was now called. The Shawnees, too, knew that name as Kenton Butler would soon find out. In the fall of 1778, Kenton and two others set out to retrieve some horses the Shawnee had taken. This they managed to do. They were on their way home when a party of Shawnee mounted warriors attacked. One of the two men accompanying Kenton was killed and, yes, scalped. The other escaped and Kenton was captured. The warriors had no idea who they were holding until the next morning when they met up with another Shawnee party which immediately recognized him. And Steve, <laughs> they certainly were in no mood to be nice to their captive. Uh, no, 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 they weren't. You see, Simon Kenton was tied to the back of an unbroken horse with a halter joining his neck to the horse's neck and rump. Now, the animal is then whipped, causing it to dash off into the woods, trying desperately to get rid of its unwanted passenger. Kenton was severely beaten by the brush and limbs of the trees as the horse ran through the woods, but he managed to stay on the animal and avoid being strangled by the halter around his neck. When they got to the Shawnee village, he was stripped naked and made to run the gauntlet, with the entire village beating him with sticks or clubs as he ran, and that running the gauntlet rod was supposed to be probably one of the worst things you'd ever have to go through. That was called drumline when I was in band. <laughs> <laughs> they would take drumsticks and they would just, you had to walk through them like that, and yes, it did hurt, so I understand perfectly. Yep, well, the object for the prisoner was to make it through the gauntlet to the council house, where he was safe until the council decided his fate. And Kenton almost made it the quarter mile to the council house, but just before getting there, he was struck a blow across the back of his legs, causing him to fall, which earned him a severe beating from his attackers, causing him to pass out. When he awoke, he was picked up and made to run the gauntlet again. He survived the second gauntlet, which impressed his captor so much that they began to take him to neighboring villages, where he would be forced to run the gauntlet again and again and again. Wow. Talk about taking a beating out of that, that's for sure. Well, one of the largest Shawnee villages was Makacheek in what's now Logan County, Ohio. Figuring he couldn't keep running these gauntlets, I know I got to the point I couldn't run them anymore. Well, he decided to make his escape no matter the cost. So when he got started running, he turned and ran straight into an old woman, knocking her down, then headed straight into the woods. He managed to outrun the villagers, and it would seem he had made his escape. Sadly, no. In those woods, he ran directly into another Shawnee war party led by Chief Blue Jacket. The chief had come to see the famous Simon Kenton Butler run that day's gauntlet. The chief rode Kenton down and smashed him in the head with his iron tomahawk, 
leaving a dent the size of a dollar coin in Kenton's skull that remained there for the rest of his life. Kenton was taken to the principal village of the Shawnee and was told that he was to run one more gauntlet, after which he would be burned at the stake. He was painted black, forced to run the gauntlet, then was tied to the stake, and you guessed it, the fuel was lit. But, Rod, a sudden downpour gave Simon Kenton a one-day reprieve, with his execution scheduled for the next day when things dried out. And that one day was all Kenton needed. The next morning, another Shawnee war party entered the village. With this party was a white man named Simon Gertie, another very famous Appalachian name. Mr. Gertie had been kidnapped into the tribe as a boy before leaving. He had sided with the British in the Revolutionary War, becoming a hated man by the patriots in the colonies. As a result, Gertie had rejoined his adopted tribe, which was allied with the British in the war. And Simon Gertie and Simon Kenton had become good friends back at Fort Pitt during Lord Dunmore's war. So close, they had actually become blood brothers. Gertie, seeing Kenton, spoke to the tribal elders and convinced them to free him, after which Kenton, no longer condemned, was treated as an honored guest, many of the warriors expressing admiration at his bravery. He was even adopted by an old woman as a replacement for her son, fallen in battle. Gertie took his friend out on a tour of the area, and for three weeks, Kenton recovered his strength. Things were looking up, Rod, until they took a complete reversal. But that's a story for next week in part two of the story of Simon Kenton. Wow. And to think, too, we mentioned about Daniel Boone in here. He saved Daniel Boone's life. Gosh, how many times was Daniel Boone saved at one point or another? You know, I think he, what was it? He held up in a fort over near what's called Old Castlewood, or Castlewood at least at one point, managed to survive there, and then this runs into this whole situation. Wow. I mean, this was this was as wild as it gets back in those days, wasn't it, Steve? Well, you know, that incident with Daniel Boone and the Indians and Simon Kenton, that is probably the most famous incident Mm -hmm. involving Simon Kenton. Yep. Uh, We've had comments Mm -hmm. regarding that and saying, you need to do a story about Simon Kenton. One of the reasons we're doing this, to be quite honest with you. Uh, But they always mention the fact that he saved Boone at Boonesboro. Wow. I was just looking to, and just to kind of give people an idea of what we're talking about. I just saw the list in here when I did the search of all the different names, Simon Kenton High School, Simon Kenton. Oh, mm-hmm. gosh, the list goes on and on and on and on. There's a little irony behind that, though, which, again, we'll get to at the end of part two of this particular podcast story. All right. And, folks, that's part one of the story of Simon Kenton, another one of the stories of Appalachia. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe to the Stories Podcast wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss a single one of our stories. And if you're listening to this podcast on our YouTube channel, be sure to click that subscribe button and give us a thumbs up if you don't mind. Until next we meet, y'all take care. So long, everybody. Mm -hmm.